Welcome. I'm Mark Updegrove, the President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. On behalf of our co-hosts, Humanities Texas, and the History Department at the University of Texas at Austin, we're pleased to present a conversation with Annette Gordon-Reed on her new book, On Juneteenth. A professor at Harvard University, Annette Gordon-Reed is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Hemingses of Monticello. Her other honors include the National Book Award, the National Humanities Medal, the Frederick Douglass Prize, and a MacArthur Fellowship. In her new book, On Juneteenth, the historian and native Texan examines the Texas roots of Juneteenth and its symbolism in the continued fight for racial equity. Signed copies of On Juneteenth are available at lbjstore.com. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Dinah Ramey Berry, professor of history and chairperson of the history department at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Berry is an internationally recognized scholar and consultant on the subject of slavery. Please join me in welcoming Annette Gordon-Reed and Dinah Ramey Berry. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Mm -hmm. I have lots of questions that I'm excited <laughs> to have this conversation with you. Um, as you know, I read your book with great um, admiration and um, I would love to know about the origins of your project. Like, I'm, you know, we always, we write books, but no one always knows how they got started. Yeah. So how did this project come about? Well, uh, it's sort of a long time in coming. Uh, my mm -hmm. editor had been asking me to think about writing a book about Texas, mm -hmm. a, a big book about Texas that would talk about the history of slavery and maybe start by referencing my family, maybe in an introduction and then going into talking about the history of slavery. I did a review for uh, the New York Review of Books mm -hmm. uh, a little over a year ago about Texas, five books about that. And then last year I did an essay for the New Yorker about Juneteenth specifically. Mm -hmm. So Texas has been on my mind between Bob impressing me to think about doing a book about Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just decided, you know, with his prompting that, you know, maybe this is something you could do a, a shorter version of something like this. And I wanted to do something completely different that instead of just doing a, a short history of Texas in Juneteenth, that I would make it a memoir and a history that I would bring that component of my family into it other than just more than just the introduction, but talk about it, use family stories to tell the, the story of the history of Texas. So I was here last year in the mm -hmm. middle of the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. living in Manhattan. I commute between Manhattan and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. When Harvard went virtual, I decided to stay in New York where my husband is, I mean, yeah. which is why I'm still in New York. And yeah. so I was here in, we were in the apartment with not many places to go, yeah. but Central Park <laughs> uh, and go outside and walk around in the park and then come back. And seeing the, the tents in the park mm -hmm. for the overflow of the people who were hospitalized for COVID and thinking about mortality, thinking right. about my parents, you know, what mm -hmm. they would have made of all of this, this very, you know, kind of unique situation that we were in. Uh, I decided that I would write a more personal, that sort of reinf reinforced the idea that I wanted to write a more personal mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. at the history of Texas, but also do it the a style of writing that I always wanted to do that's but separate from different from the kind of writing I typically do right. as a historian. And so that's how the project was born. Wow. That's interesting because if we think about what we do during the pandemic, it's neat to see that there's creativity. And we, we've talked about that uh, in a number of different spaces that we still can be creative in a, in a very difficult moment. Mm -hmm. And I like that you turn this, this pandemic and the isolation and, and having to be quarantined and living in our homes um, as a way to produce something and produce something very personal. And that was, mm -hmm. that was, that was my next question was, what was it like writing about <laughs> Um, your personal, I mean, most, most of your writing is very professional. I mean, you've obviously mm -hmm. done legal writing, but then you've mm -hmm. written a number of books about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And I'm wondering, you know, how was it to write something that was memoir? Was it a different style or was it, was it more challenging? 
I think it was challenging in a way because you really do have to open up when you're writing yes. a memoir. Uh, and uh, I, I open up in this book, my, my co-author, Peter Onuf, who read the manuscript said, well, you do open up in a sort of an Annette Gordon Reedy kind of way, meaning it's open, but not way open. Right. Um, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to be the focus of it. I wanted my family story to figure in it, but I didn't want it to be about me. Mm-hmm. So there were questions about, do I want to use the names of everybody? Mm-hmm. And I mentioned the names of my mother and my father. I don't, and, and you know, I don't mention my grandparents' name, great grandparents' name, or any of those things like that. I wanted them to be a part of it, mm-hmm. but I didn't want my family story to take over from what I was trying to say about Texas mm-hmm. uh, and the history of Texas and the, the prehistory of Texas, the entity, mm-hmm. the state called Texas. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, the decisions about how much information you want to give, um, how much, you, how open you want it to be. I mean, I I have sort of a love hate relationship with memoir. Um, uh-huh. uh, I like them, but there's something for me. I, mm-hmm. I would not want. I have difficulty revealing or thinking about revealing the lives of other people, not because they have mm-hmm. anything to be ashamed of or, or anything like that. As so much as I don't have their permission. Yes. Uh, yes. And I don't have these, even people who are dead, mainly people who are dead. Mm-hmm. You know, why should their stories mm-hmm. be out there? Um, because I decide I want to write a book, which is probably mm-hmm. why I never could make it as a novelist too, because novelists <laughs> always mind the stories of their yeah. families mm-hmm. and the and their friends and everybody around them. And I just have this, I don't know. I have a difficulty with that. So yeah, it was, you're, you're being open, but there's that reticence that I have about mm-hmm. being too open. So I had to find the right balance for myself. It felt comfortable for you. It, that it makes, felt comfortable yeah. for me. I think, I think my editor might've wanted me to have names, wanted me to, to do more of that, but I really mm-hmm. just didn't, I didn't want to do anything that didn't feel, and, you know, he obviously backed me in that, uh, that mm-hmm. felt uncomfortable to me. So I wanted to have enough detachment to mm-hmm. put my family in there, but keep Texas as the focus. Right. I, you know, I understand that idea about, um, about what to share, especially when you're writing about other people. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's, for me, it's a gut feeling where I feel like I'm, I, I come across a story in the archive and I, I don't feel like I have the permission to write about it. And I don't like whenever mm-hmm. I have a gut feeling about that, I'm just like, okay, That's I'm going to leave this one there. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but then you there's other do what's times, comfortable to you. Yeah. There's other times where you feel like there's something that's really drawing you towards going deeper in, into that, um, mm-hmm. into different aspects. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you mentioned about, you know, you're from Texas and you, I know you're a proud Texan. Mm-hmm. So um, what I like about the book about on Juneteenth is that you really are, it's really a history of Texas from a personal perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it really touches on some of the major flashpoints of Texas history and the major flashpoints of even some of the contemporary debates that we're having about American history. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to know if you could say a little bit about um, about the beginnings. I love I love the origin stories. That was one of my favorite chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, but could you talk a little bit about about how you decided to make different choices about what to include uh, regarding Texas history? Mm-hmm. Well, You know, I also decided that I was going to construct it as a history of Texas talking about people, Mm -hmm. uh, telling the stories through the people of Texas. And Mm -hmm. there are different people in Texas. There are indigenous people, Indians, Mm -hmm. uh, people of African descent, Europeans, Anglo-Americans, Latino. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I wanted to try to have chapters and vignettes and things that talked about each group and how I connected to each of those groups. Mm-hmm. And so because I you know, had this experience of, of being a child integrating our town school district that put me in touch, our, our town schools, mm-hmm. that put me in touch with the issue of race mm-hmm. and the, and the, uh, the issue of law and race. And you kind of wind the tape back and you realize that a lot of this stuff, Jim Crow, is an outgrowth of was an outgrowth of the end of slavery when mm-hmm. people were trying to put things back as near to slavery as they could get it. Yeah. And so you just keep walking back and, you know, it just kind of unfolds. The story is you, you could find out, you know, how we got to this place where mm-hmm. I was in the mid sixties in a situation where 
it was a big deal mm -hmm. for a black child to go to a white school, why there had been so much resistance to Brown, you mm -hmm. know, a decade's worth of that in Texas. So the idea was to tell the stories of people using my life, look, th using things that happen. And, and fortunately, mm -hmm. I had, fortunately, unfortunately, whatever, yeah. <laughs> I had that hook mm -hmm. of having done this thing that made me a, a figure of, a minor figure of history in this little town, mm -hmm. um, that that was a good jumping off place to begin and, and talk about the story of Texas and, mm -hmm. and why we'd gotten to that point where that was something that was necessary and was considered a controversial thing to do. Mm -hmm. So what was it like um, desegregating your school? And I know that was a big decision for your parents to send mm -hmm. you to the white school. Mm -hmm. Your mother was a school teacher um, mm -hmm. at the, was it the Booker T. Washington school that she yeah. taught. Mm -hmm. And so you, they made the decision to send you to an all white school. Did you, I, I didn't get the sense from what you shared mm -hmm. that you had violent um, responses to your presence but I did get the sense that there was tension and I'm, and I'm not asking you to talk about it if you're not comfortable, but I'm oh, just no, no. curious about that a little bit. No, I, I heard later on that there were threats against my family, but not, no, nothing that impacted me in that particular way. Mm -hmm. I was not escorted into the school. My father drove me and dropped mm -hmm. me off and I just you know started as if it were normal. I didn't take the bus mm -hmm. and there was a bus. And so I think obviously there was a sense of thinking that maybe that was a bridge too far. Yeah. Um, that, that, you know, it would be better if he, you know, took me. Mm -hmm. um, but there was an agreement from the school district and my parents and the media, what, you know, was the media at that time, the one mm -hmm. newspaper um, mm -hmm. that we would make, would not make a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. And that, um, yeah, I would make a big deal about it. And I would just show up and be mm -hmm. there and get started. It was, a difficult time. I had a, mm -hmm. I mean, I knew that it was a big deal mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. that because I could tell by the way people were talking about it. I had a relative who was very close to us, uh, very close to my mother who lived in Houston and she went out to Sackowitz. Mm -hmm. uh, Sackowitz was the big department store, mm -hmm. fancy place and bought, you know, lots and lots of clothes. I mean, I had clothes, but she wanted Certain kind of clothes. Certain, you know, she wanted, you know, me to, you know, I could go for days with not, you know, with different outfits. All not the time. repeating. Yeah. Not repeating, <laughs> not repeating anything. And, you know, so I had a sense that that was her, she, that was her uh, contribution, right? That mm -hmm. this is how she was going to support me in all of this. So I knew it was a big deal. Um, I would say tension was more mm. the feeling. I mean, my teacher, Mrs. Daughtry, who was my first grade teacher, uh, we all know our first grade teachers. Now. Yes, yes. Um, and Mrs. Gilliland, my second grade teacher, those mm -hmm. would, these would be the, the formative mm -hmm. moments there. They were just fantastic to me. They were deeply supportive. And, you know, I've said this, I, I didn't think about this until after I wrote the book that maybe one of the reasons, in addition to being stellar human beings, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that my mother was a teacher, I mm -hmm. wonder if that this was not some professional courtesy yes, <laughs> that was going yes. on there and thinking uh, in, in the way they they handled me. Some of the kids were nice and some of them weren't. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a sense that some people, some of them went out of their way to be friendly and maybe their parents had encouraged that or maybe mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. on their own. And some of them were pretty, could be pretty nasty, or you could be going along and everything is okay. And then, then they would say something that mm. let you know that, wait a minute, <laughs> we're <laughs> friends, <not> okay. <laughs> but it's not okay. It's yeah. not completely okay. Or I talk about people who would be friendly to me in school, but then when they saw me out you know, places at the, mm -hmm. out, of, out of that context, mm -hmm. exactly, mm -hmm. with their parents or their relatives, they would be standoffish. Mm -hmm. And that too made me think, you know, about race and think about the position that we were in. You know, why would people who I sensed really liked me, you can kind of tell when, when people are fainting mm -hmm. or when they oh, yeah. mean it, but they're, they love their parents too. And, mm -hmm. and, there's, and how hard it is. And my father used to talk about this and say, you know, mm -hmm. your friends could want to do what is right. Mm -hmm. They know what's right, but they can't do it because their community will 
not allow them. The, the, mm. Their community will reject them. And people aren't, no one wants to be rejected. I mean, for, right. uh, you know, whatever they felt about me, we love our parents and our relatives and we put up <laughs> with them and yes. we do things that, you know, we, you know, we I, I accept things that we don't think are right because mm-hmm. we don't want to fall out of their favor. So mm-hmm. there was just a, it's a complicated thing and mm-hmm. made more complicated when, um, because some of the black students after segregation was ended and they forcibly made everybody join together who felt that I had been the reason for this and they mm. resented the loss of their school. So I had it for both sides in some wow. ways. So that's, you're talking about, you're referring to when the schools were actually, when all the schools were integrated, not yes. just you going to, yeah, and yeah. that's when, okay. And the black but Yeah, students. when they when they struck down, the court struck down mm-hmm. freedom of choice plans. And mm-hmm. so the schools became integrated and Booker T. Washington uh, ceased to be what it had been uh, mm-hmm. in the community for many, many years. And I, I think the kids got it, may have gotten it garbled. I was sort of a, it was as if I had caused that. Mm-hmm. But I obviously like, I didn't um, right. legal decision. Um, but I was the symbol, I say, a symbol of, of a loss. And there mm-hmm. was a real loss for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you talk about that a little bit about about how the the segregated schools and the community. And it seemed like you had a really strong black community that you were a part of, mm-hmm. um, although you went to a white school. Um, there was a sense of loss or or change. And I've heard this, there's all kinds of debates about this when we look at, at yeah. the issue of segregation, right? And I've, I've heard mm-hmm. it from my own family. My own mother mm-hmm. talked about this, about mm-hmm. growing up in a segregated community, how things change after segregation. Um, so what was, what was the conversation within the Black community that you recall around that time when the schools were desegregated? Well, you know, there was anger. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I talk about a, a, a kid who basically was hitting me Mm-hmm. Uh, whom I didn't know, you know, it, it was a, this surreal experience of having being attacked, physically yeah. attacked by somebody that you don't know who they are. Mm-hmm. I knew what the problem was. I mean, I knew mm-hmm. why he didn't like me, right. but I, I didn't know who he was. And that was a, a, a theme, you know, throughout yeah. my uh, childhood that, that people knew who I was. I didn't know who they were. Right. And some people liked what I represented and other people didn't. And yeah. I would be in these situations facing hostile people thinking, you know, who are you? I mean, what, yeah. what is this? I know what it's about, but why do you think that I am responsible for this? Um, what I heard later from my mother mm-hmm. was becoming a bit disillusioned because one of the things that happened when they integrated the schools was that across the South, is that many of the teachers in black schools were taken out of the classroom. And there was integration of the kids, but not integration of the power structure. Mm -hmm. Integration, because white parents did not want black teachers teaching their kids. So black kids lost the role models. Yeah, that's important. And white kids lost the opportunity to have black people as role models. Mm-hmm. as models. So, you know, it's like Blackstone, the, the, the husband and wife, the two become one and the one was him. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. here it is a similar thing. There was integration, but it was all one way. Black mm-hmm. people had to come to whiteness. Mm-hmm. White people didn't, you know, come to blackness in any, any kind of way. It didn't mm-hmm. change the power structure. So um, yeah, that, that was, yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about this because yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm romanticizing segregation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, mm-hmm. you, you can't have a, a system of dual citizenship of legalized yeah. dual, you know, inferior status for right. an American citizen. So we just can't do that. We have to come up with something different. Right. But the reality is that for some people that, sense of community because the teachers lived in the community Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they socialized with the parents they went to the same churches Mm -hmm. all those things i i Mm -hmm. loved my first grade teacher but she didn't live in our community she didn't socialize so we were texans but we were separated by race right and we could meet at some places but it wasn't wasn't the kind of organic situation uh Mm -hmm. close situation that existed 
among teachers and students uh, from Booker T. Washington. Well, I like the point you raise about um, that, that they lost, that white students lost the opportunity to be taught by black teachers. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point. That's one, that's something that gets lost with, with integration because that would change the way people see black people, I think, overall, that, that could have changed the way, the perceptions of, of, of the qualities of, of black people, whatever those qualities might be, right? Yeah. Um, so I, yeah. I think that's a really good point. And I appreciate you sharing that because I know um, that was not an easy time period in your life. And, and I feel like, you know, you, you sound, you talk so casually about it, which I appreciate. <laughs> but I mean, this is a big deal that, that you integrated a school. I mean, during a time where it could have been very challenging. So I just, I'm, I'm glad you shared that. I mean, when I was reading the book, I remember being, I had, I've known you for years mm -hmm. um, and, and seen you at conferences and, and done, you know, panels and stuff with you before, but I had never, I never, I never knew your personal story. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was thinking like, that's, a, that's a big load to carry, like as a young child, but it seemed like you handled it very well. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to thank you for sharing that story with the mm -hmm. wide audience that you now have shared that story because it's it's a story about integration that will allow people to understand it from a very personal perspective. So yeah. I think it's very important. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, while I was working on this, after I finished the book, actually, I found an essay that I had written mm. some years ago and it must've been a long time ago because it was like courier type, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. it was a long time ago yeah. and about this experience. Mm. And it could have been a, you know, it was basically a Texas town, but written before mm -hmm. the Hemings is a Monticello. I don't, rem I don't remember. It was so long ago. I don't remember doing wow. it. And, uh, you know, I think it, what I did recently is better than that, um, <laughs> but it, basically the same themes, which means that this is something that has been on my mind a long time. Mm -hmm. that I had sort of buried after I you know, went off into Hemings and Jefferson land. Um, but something that I had wanted to write about and did mm -hmm. write about, but never, you know, submitted it anywhere or anything, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it kind of is a big deal. You yeah. know, I don't, I don't, I haven't thought of it that way. in in you know, for most of my life, but um, it's a big deal. I have kids of my own. I don't mm -hmm. know that I would have done that. Yeah, I was I thinking about that when I read it. I sent them to a school that was predominantly white, but not, mm -hmm. they weren't the only black kids right. there. And right. they were black teachers. And so, I mean, it wasn't like that, but what I'm, the difference is, I think my parents, this, they were in a moment, mm -hmm. 64, 65, mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, yeah. black people were on the move. Everybody mm -hmm. was doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody was doing their part yes. uh, for race uplift. Everybody was doing that. And so I, I can't replicate that moment when my kids were that age, because right. we were beyond that, there were other issues that mm -hmm. were involved, but not that. And so I think they did that in the, the spirit of the moment. Right. So let's, let's talk a little about Texas history. Um, you know, you were right in saying that the Texas history is taught uh, in two different grades, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, is it fourth and seventh or fifth fourth and seventh? And seven. Fourth and, and seventh. seventh. It was yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. It still is. It still is actually. Mm -hmm. Um so what, what, what is the grand narrative of Texas and how does your story about Texas uh, either mirror that or diverge from it? Well, the grand narrative Texas, of Texas that people mainly know is mm -hmm. of this state that of independent mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. forged a place in the wilderness in an mm -hmm. empty land, a near empty land that forged a place in the wilderness and created at some point there, got, you know, threw off the Mexican oppressors and mm -hmm. started their own republic and mm -hmm. then joined the United States and, you know, a lost cause, mm -hmm. uh, became a part of the lost cause and mm -hmm. then discovered oil, <laughs> after that became, you know, cattle ranch and oil. I mean, yeah. there's a, there's a narrative about Texas that's very much set by Hollywood mm -hmm. and, um, you know, things that we see on television, the story of the West, which it is a part of the West. Yeah. And uh, there's that aspect of it, but mm -hmm. burying the part about the enslavers, about mm -hmm. the people who had slave plantations. It was a mm -hmm. slave society and people don't think of it that way. And that mm -hmm. the hidden narrative is the narrative that hides my great, great, great grandparents uh, on my mother's side, 
It can be traced back to at least the 1820s in Texas before it's a republic mm-hmm. and um, certainly before it's a state and on both mm-hmm. sides, actually, before mm-hmm. it's a state. Um, so this idea that that you can hide that, that that's not a part of the, the understanding mm-hmm. means that there's there are misunderstandings about Texas and stuff mm-hmm. happens there. And people wonder, what's that about? Mm-hmm. You know, what's this race business? I mean, what, what does that have to do with cowboys? What does that have right. to do with uh, cattle ranchers and oil? And mm-hmm. that plantation society and the legacies of that shaped my hometown. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it's part of my family history and part of my family story. So there's a grand narrative, but there's a narrative that people are trying to have been trying to, you know, complicate as we say in history right. and then now yeah. we i see i gather from the newspapers yeah there's a reaction <laughs> there's uh, a strong reaction to it strong reaction to that yeah and i, I wonder how that effort's going to go because you know i've asked I me mean, how do you teach about the texas republic without talking about the constitution right and so what is it about i mean you, I, I think you put actually parts of the text of the constitution in the book right mm-hmm. yes um, what part, I mean, I, I appreciated that because I always talk about primary documents and how when we talk about, there's a nostalgic perspective about the past, like, we, like you've been sharing here. But then there's also, if we look at the actual primary documents, we can understand what people were responding to. And so what, why did you choose to put that in? And what is, what is in there that you think we needed to know about? Well, I think I, I put it in there to have people think seriously about in the words you use, the grand narrative yeah. of the, this little republic, mm-hmm. uh, this plucky little republic that starts and creates the, the sort of Texas spirit of independence and mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But to understand that that was in large measure in support of slavery. Right. I mean, they had other problems, obviously, yeah. uh, different cultures, different language, religion. There, there were points of tension there. But the Texans were concerned and were insecure about uh, the Mexican position on slavery. And they looked the other way with the Texians because they re- initially wanted them there to sort of be a bulwark against and help, you know, fend off Comanches and, uh, and other people, uh, Indian people who were there who claimed the land as well. But then this conflict over different understandings about what people would say a way of life led to this break. So what are, what are we supposed to do with that? How are people who want to be forward thinking in Texas, who want a, a Texas that belongs to everybody, right. you can't just pretend that that didn't happen. Right. But, I think, yeah, yeah. Part, part of the way they're pitching it, and we saw this, um, I think it was just yesterday, the day before, that our governor, Greg Abbott, signed a law establishing the 1836 project, which mm-hmm. is now it's sort of modeled after Trump's 1776 commission. And um, they say that they want to promote a patriotic education. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, what is patriotism? Patriotism, And why, why is if we present history as it was and talk about the documents and we're telling stories about Native people and people of African descent who contributed to this history, how is that not patriotic? I don't understand that. <laughs> I, I don't understand it either. I don't understand patriotism, just as I wouldn't understand a concept of love that made you say that the person that you love is perfect Mm -hmm. and that you can't love them unless they are perfect. It's like parents who have kids and everybody else is always wrong. Mm -hmm. The teacher's wrong. The kids are wrong. Your kid is always right. Or any, but any person you love not recognizing weaknesses yourself, not recognizing where we fall short with the hope of making them better. And so I don't, I don't, I think that's to me is self-indulgent to think about love in that way. It's all about your feelings, all about you and your response, instead of thinking, look, you know, we have this document, this primary document that unlike the United States constitution that kind of tiptoes around the issue of slavery, persons hurled to service uh, versus this thing that is sort of a full-throated endorsement and acceptance of slavery and says that African people of African descent can't be citizens. You can't just skip over though. You can't redact those provisions and just look at the stuff that you like. You have to deal forthrightly with it and say, you know, they were wrong. Either, if you believe they're wrong, if you believe that slavery was wrong, 
If you believe that black people should be citizens, then you, there's no way to square that with what they're doing without saying, you know, they were wrong about that. But and I guess you could mm-hmm, say yeah. we're going to go forward mm-hmm. with this, but not acknowledging that I, I just it would be it's not a matter of interpretation. It's not like somebody looking at a document and say, well, there are two ways to see it. That's point blank. Yeah. In the yeah. Constitution. And how yeah. do you how are they getting around that? I don't know. I mean, my 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 thought as a as a as a professor is that you teach you just teach the history and, and we can't control how students respond, you know, to how we can't control how students feel. And mm-hmm. we don't have I, I think a good instructor would just say this. These are the experiences from all these different perspectives. This is experience from a Comanche. This is experience from an African a person of African descent. This is experience of somebody of Anglo descent. This is a person of Mexican. Like, these are how people experience a particular moment. And mm-hmm. I think you really do a great job of that in throughout the book, throughout mm-hmm. the whole book. You're talking about um, the history, like the, the origin stories and talk in that section where you're talking about Esteban, right? And, mm-hmm. and I love what you said. If you could say a little bit about this notion of him being an interpreter and knowing languages and how that would change if you had learned that in your fourth grade or your seventh grade Texas history class, how that would have changed the way you see either yourself or see American history. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we mentioned Esteban, we call him Esteban. I guess it's yeah. Estebanico is the yes. way, it's, it's yeah. common usage of what they described him, uh, diminutive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talked about him in passing, Mm-hmm. But I, I think it would have made a difference if, if we don't, we have an origin story in Africans in America mm-hmm. that is just about plantation slavery, mm-hmm. just about Jamestown, as mm-hmm. if, you know, people of African descent here are the creation of British people. Right. <laughs> essentially, right. that's an important inflection point. But mm-hmm. you should know that there were people of African descent in the area that was Texas and Mexico, Mm -hmm. 100 years before Jamestown and St. Augustine, they're there Mm -hmm. uh, as settlements, in in settlements there. And, you know, they spoke a different language, but that doesn't mean that there were not points of commonality with English speaking enslaved people. They were both people, groups of people who had been brought from Africa to be enslaved and who lived under white supremacy. To my mind, that is a more important connector than the fact that Europeans spoke different language and carved up different parts of the United States and the British won, you know. I mean, so what? We don't we shouldn't define ourselves by how our captors viewed themselves and their societies. They would have been treated if a, a black person escaped from, you know, San Augustine or whatever was brought from there up to Virginia or you know vice versa they'd be treated the same way they'd be seen the same way so i think an origin story about a person who was who was a translator who was for a time when they were away from spanish settlements had to have been treated as more equal because they were trying to survive they dwindled from 300 down to 4 walking across Texas, miles and uh, miles, <laughs> miles and miles across mm-hmm. Texas and Mexico or over to the Pacific seaboard mm-hmm. and black people, others who came with mm-hmm. the Spanish and who broke away from them. And some went down to Vera Cruz mm-hmm. and, you know, made a genetic mark right, on the right. people there. And, you know, to know that black people did lots of things, there's constant effort to limit mm-hmm the capabilities and the experiences of of black people in this language business, I thought was intriguing to me because, you know, I I talk about this in the book and how exasperating it is when people have asked me over the years, you know, how did James and Sally Hemings, you know, learn to speak French? Like, (laughs) you know, like they, black people speaking French, you know, what is, what's going on with that? How could that happen? and it's this sense of limitation questions mm-hmm. that I don't think would have been asked yeah. about a white person, say, who mm-hmm. had been taken over to France as a servant. Mm-hmm. No one would be asking after five years living there. Well, how did he learn how to speak French? Exactly. Exactly. You know? So the, the sense of limitation, if you tell if you if children have a broader sense of, you know, the capabilities of people of African descent, I th- mm-hmm. it just shapes the way you see 
black people in general. I agree. I agree with that. Thank you. Um, another point in the book that I thought was really interesting was when you talked about um, where you were from. Mon- was the Montgomery County? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. That's where mm-hmm. I, yeah, I was born in Polk County. Yeah. And okay. When I was about six months old, my parents moved to Conroe, which is in Montgomery County. Right. So you talk about a few um, racial incidents that occurred there before you before you were there before you were born. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a few lynchings um, mm-hmm. that have. I'm, I'm calling them lynchings. Is that what is that how you would characterize? I mean, yes, these yes, are, yes. So did you grow up, did you hear about those stories as well? Um, were they part of the lore and were you worried about the KKK or other racialized, racial violence activities while you were growing up there? I was not worried about That's the good. Klan when I was there, even though I may, may I should have been because <laughs> they were active in this area. I mean, I was in childhood, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I mean, I knew that store owners were sometimes not nice to us. I mm-hmm. knew, I understand, I stood about all of that, but I, I don't think, I didn't, did not live under the idea that I was under constant threat of, of, mm-hmm. of violence, even though I knew that there was tension mm-hmm. in the air. And there's just, again, it's this thing, you don't know exactly where this comes from, but um, this was a town that had a history of lynching. Uh, a man was mm-hmm. burned at the stake on Courthouse Square on the courthouse square in the 1920s which is the same um, place where people were auctioned off exactly. in the 1820s or not yeah. 1820s probably 1840s yeah, 1850s yeah. yeah in courthouses and mm-hmm. in a place where i worked <laughs> mm-hmm. um, just before i went off to law school and the, the this history in this place their their sort of atmosphere the atmosphere it, mm-hmm. it almost it doesn't leave the atmosphere i think when you when you have things like that happen it shapes right. the way people view view things. And, you know, very famously, well, my grandfather told me the story of of Bob White, Mm -hmm. who had been accused of raping a white woman in Livingston. And while he was incarcerated, when he was being held in the jail, the Texas Rangers took him out every night and tied him to a tree and whipped him until he confessed. This was a case, and I did not know this until I was working on the book. Oh, wow. That went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I teach criminal procedure. Yeah. And, you know, the the court says, you know, not surprisingly, I guess, that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, taking somebody out and tying them to a tree and whipping them until they confess was a violation of the due process. Right. (laughs) And send it back down. Now, I teach, you know, this stuff, but I use Brown versus Mississippi. Okay. I was surprised they sent it. I was surprised they sent it back down. Yeah. For a new trial. yeah, that was really interesting. And sent it right back to the same community at first. Well, right? they sent, yeah, they sent it to, well, it, they had been in Livingston and then they had mm-hmm. a change of venue to Conroe, my two mm-hmm. towns, mm-hmm. because, you know, allegedly, well, because Conroe, I mean, everybody knew these people. That's what my I was grandfather thinking. knew Bob White. He knew mm-hmm. the Cochran's. He knew all mm-hmm. the, the parties. It was a very, it's even smaller than Conroe. Okay. So they sent it there. And while the trial was pending, the husband walks into the courtroom and shoots. Bob White, the back of the head, killing him instantly, hands the pistol to the bailiff or some you know, official there. And very quickly, he's tried. He is tried. But then mm-hmm. he's acquitted, like in two or three minutes. And everybody cheers. And he was never punished for that. And that really, yeah. you know, I, w- the thing that n- now that I, once I realized that this case had a proceed, the procedural history of the case, mm-hmm. I understood that they, you know, it, it went all the way up to the court. And I think I can only imagine that black people had some sense of hope mm-hmm. because, you know, went, it yeah. went up and then it came back and they thought, OK, maybe we mm-hmm. will have some justice here. And he kills him and then nothing happens. And so that my I had relatives who would not spend the night in Conroe oh, uh, wow. because wow. of that, because it just it was it so disgusted people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, lynching the mob. I mean, that's that just makes you wonder about human nature, right? You know, people yeah. coming to a lynching you know, like it's a picnic or something right. like and that. Right, smiling but, you know, these in front are, of burning bodies. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But the idea that you could be in a courtroom <laughs> and do this and yeah. nothing happen, uh, then then all hope is lost. Essentially, is the way yeah. people saw that. That's interesting because there's there, there might be a dissertation topic in this because there's a student, a former student of mine wrote a paper, and I think it was published in one of the Texas journals 
on a guy named Hal Geiger, mm -hmm. who was an African American man who was a lawyer representing um, some black women. And he was shot in court because the judge did not like the tone that he didn't give him enough deference in court. Mm -hmm. He was an attorney. So I'm just saying, here's, here's a second Texas courtroom where an African, shot. yeah, like, oh my goodness, who, who, yeah. who thought about that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you hear these kinds of stories, then you don't really wonder about yeah. what's happening now. I mean, it's hard to erase this stuff, mm -hmm. to get rid of all of this in a, you know, I mean, I think the, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor's notion that, well, 25 years from now, this will all be over. It's like, uh, no, this it's could take a long form. time. Yeah. yeah, changed form. Yeah. So I want to I want to close with um, some thoughts about Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that I, I said in my I reviewed the book and I said, you and know, thank you just, very much. Oh, that was a very welcome. thoughtful review. Oh, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to talk more about the, the Supreme Court case, but I didn't want to give it away. So I didn't <laughs> say so much about that. But um, but I had well two things I want to say. One completely before we get to Juneteenth, I grew up in California. And mm -hmm. I used to go growing up, we would go to Six Flags, uh, mm -hmm. Six Flags. Um, it, it was called Six Flags Magic Mountain. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that it came from Texas. And I had mm -hmm. no idea that it came from the six flags that flew over Texas. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And I love how you always said in the book, over Texas. You know, every time you talk about Six Flags, you don't think about it as Six Flags. <laughs> over Texas. Over Texas. <laughs> so I thought that was really, really interesting. And I thought, um, how many people go to this amusement park and not have no idea that there's, that there's a connection to Texas? And the, the historical connection is the Six Flags. And I think uh -huh. that you make a great point that Texas is a wonderful state to study, to understand American history in a way because of the Six Flags that flew over it, is what I, yeah. is what I thought you were saying. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, so that was just one little side point. But my my thing about Juneteenth was I was saying that for the readers that pick up this book, if you're looking for you know these stories about what people do all day and you know during Juneteenth celebrations, they're not going to have that. This is really a history and a memoir, but a history of Texas through the eyes of Juneteenth, and that's mm -hmm. sort of how you came to it, is what I thought. Mm -hmm. But I would love to know, like, what did you do to celebrate Juneteenth? I mean, this is becoming mm -hmm. such a huge national and in some places uh, other countries are now starting to recognize it whether it's a holiday that's celebrated that corporations are giving people the day off mm -hmm. um, there are some counties and cities that are also making it and there's some states have made it a, a holiday outside of texas that did mm -hmm. so i would love to know what you grew up doing um during doing i know you ate some unusual foods right yeah well <laughs> you know we drank red soda water yep. um and we had barbecue. There were some people, there's a tradition of barbecued goat. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. And our family didn't partake of that, mm -hmm. uh, but others did. Uh, traditional kind of Southern fare. Mm -hmm. And in our family, we made tamales. That's and cool. that's very that, Texas too, right? That's very <laughs> Texas too. I mean, to have these group, these these foods together, you have soul food, what people would recognize as Southern black cuisine mm -hmm. and barbecuing and red soda water. I don't know where the red soda water came in. I mean, you know, all of these Chinese traditions sometimes have uh, stories grafted onto them. Right. I've since heard that red was supposed to represent the blood that had been shed in slavery. Oh, interesting. I don't know that. I mean, I, yeah. I've not heard that. Until I haven't seen recently. that either. Yeah. But there's something about red, the strawberry pie that some people mm -hmm. do, red mm -hmm. soda water. Um, and some people suggest hibiscus was the thing that, mm. which would have, hibiscus tea, which would, mm -hmm. would have people wouldn't have had big red in the right. 1870s, <laughs> 1880s. Um, so yeah, that's what we did. And we ran around and drank too much soda water, which mm -hmm. we didn't get very much of in those days because that yeah. was not something yes. we did. We didn't drink yes. soda every day. Um, and we threw firecrackers, <laughs> which How is funny. yeah fun as below yeah. 10. I can't believe that they let us have matches and firecrackers. But, exactly. <laughs> you know, it was, that was what they did in those days. Um, so yeah, that's it was a day of sort of unbridled celebration. It was sort of the, a black 4th of July. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would have seen it then. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, one last question. What would you want people to take away from this book on Juneteenth? If there was one message or, or, or do you have one message that you want people to take well, away? I have lots of messages, but mm -hmm. one thing that I do think of is listen to your grandparents, mm -hmm. take your family histories, mm -hmm. pay attention to that. I, I have so much regret for having had my great grandmother for, 
you know, 11 years and not listen seriously to the things that she was saying yeah. and not ask her more about her lives. All, we are all part of the history of our states and our country. And one way of keeping that alive is to talk to the elders and make sure you take their stories down. Well, on that note, I want to thank you so much for your time and for this wonderful book on Juneteenth. If For those that are watching, if you haven't read it, please go out and get it. It's an excellent education on uh, the history of Texas, but also a, a wonderful memoir of a phenomenal scholar. So thank you so much, Professor You're very welcome. Gordon thank you for inviting me. Thanks You're for welcome. inviting me. Bye-bye. Our thanks to Dr. Barry and Professor Gordon Reed. Signed copies of On Juneteenth are available at lbjstore.com. Thanks also to our program's sponsors, the Moody Foundation and St. David's Healthcare. We depend on your membership support to produce programming like this. If you aren't already a member, please consider joining the Friends of the LBJ Library at lbjlibrary.org. Our next program on June 29th will feature former U.S. Senator and Virginia Governor Chuck Robb. We'll talk about his new memoir, In the Arena. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.